You're listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense with your host, Doug Thorpe. Here's Doug. Hello again, everyone. This is Doug Thorpe, and you're listening to another episode of Leadership Powered by Common Sense. Today, I've got a gentleman who has uh, grown up in uh, uh, and a native of my hometown, San Antonio, Texas. It's going to be a pleasure to get him on. His name is Jesse Hernandez. Jesse, welcome to the show. Good morning. Hello, Doug. Happy to be here, sir. Well, I am excited to have you here as well. Jesse is a is a man who has uh, worked most of his adult life in the construction trades. He is now a consultant to all things in that industry. But we are also going to dip into a discussion about creating a culture of appreciation. If you've followed my show for a while, you know I'm a big champion of building the right culture in your business, regardless of how big your company may be and knowing and thinking about the kind of culture you want to grow uh, we're, we're, we're going to slice words a little bit. Uh, I, it's been said before on my show, you don't build a culture, you grow a culture. And there, there's a certain irony here, talking to a guy that's made his living out of building things. Uh, it, it, it's going to be a different kind of spin here. But anyway, enough of me, Jesse. Tell folks a little bit more about your background. Thank you. So, um, I started in the trades right out of high school uh, back in the 1900s. For some people, <laughs> you and I, we know what that was like. Some other people were like, oh, I was born in. So 1995, graduated high school, got a summer job uh, working on a commercial renovation here at a Memorial High School way back. And I fell in love with the environment of the job site. I was supposed to be working to save some money so I could pay for room and board and try to be a walk-on uh, to the baseball team at Tyler Junior College, but I just knew like this is this is what I this is where I belong, <laughs> uh, and so I decided by the end of the summer I had to let Dad know because Dad's a plumber, so second generation. Dad was not happy, uh, but I just knew like this is what I had to do. So. I found an apprenticeship program, completed four years of apprenticeship, got my journeyman license as a plumber, med gas certification, master license. So I, like that was the route. Um, luckily, I, I went to work for TD Industries or a mechanical contractor, primarily in Texas, but they've got some business units in Phoenix and Denver. Um, and that organization really, like that accident, like I went there for more money straight up like i wasn't thinking a profound career path they were gonna pay me two bucks more an hour so i went over there <laughs> uh, yeah. but they had the the system the framework the culture that helped me discover new or invisible potential that i had within me and they had leaders within the organization that understood what it is to invest in people and demonstrate appreciation so i was there for about 17 years um, then I went to work for a general contractor. Uh, I had a, so I went from like a, a business unit role, San Antonio, went to work for the, one of the largest contractors in the country and I had a regional role. And so now I was going to be like, I was coming out of like the, the Bush league to the major league all of a sudden. And I had no idea whether I was going to be able to perform or deliver at that level, but I wanted to find out if I could. Um, and, and luckily I, I was able to. Uh, so I was in that space for about three and a half years. Basically, what I was doing there was I was helping support the, the deployment of change <laughs> uh, with business units, departments, projects, et cetera. And then I took a national role uh, responsibility. Again, I didn't know if I could play, but it turned out I, I wasn't so bad at it. I did that, served as a national director of environmental health and safety for a little bit because that organization wanted my contributions in a cultural transformation. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started my own business just two and a half years ago. Well, not quite two and a half, but just over two years ago, uh, I started my consulting business. So like in terms of credibility, I started at the top of the scale and all the way along, I've been sliding down, losing credibility in terms of the types of roles I've played. But I've been able to gain like, simple insight in that we are more alike than we are different and the problems that we experience 
that I got to play with, like feel and live and then solve are the same or really pretty damn similar, um, regardless of what type, if it's a billion dollar, three year capital improvement project, if it's a $15 million uh, renovation, if it's the HR department, if it's the ops department, like the problems that we have around connection and communication are transcendent through all of that. And, and I think because of the different roles I've been able to play in my career, I've been picked up a skill to like translate what that means within or through the different levels of the organization. And so now I spend most of my time talking. Yeah. <laughs> well, fa fa fascinating journey. And, and I guess the um, I, I'll, I'll ask or make a statement that a lot of listeners may be asking. I think it's safe to say when folks who have not been in the trades think about the trades, when you think about corporate speak, about change management and culture and personnel development and all that, it, it's like, no, those don't go together. They, they don't fit. They don't connect. But it couldn't be further from the truth, right? Oh, you nailed it. It's it's the same. And I, you know what? I, again, my observation is this. Uh, it's very easy to say that they're different because we've never walked in their shoes. We don't understand what it's like, but it we're all human. So it's not that they're different. We just don't know how to speak their language. <laughs> and so how you like the connectivity between the corporate objective and what my installation rate is, we don't know how to decipher that. And, and but I can, right? Like I, it, there's a, like, I'm not the only one. A lot of people can do it, but I think it takes, I know it takes an intentional focus to really appreciate another per person's uh, frame of reference or contextualize a thing in terms of what other people experience and understand on the daily. It's tough, but it's totally, <laughs> totally possible. Yeah. Well, and I, I think, again, there's a horrible amount of stereotyping that goes on. You, you think about someone in the trades and it, it's usually, you know, dirt under the fingernails, a little rough and around the edges not particularly refined or polished, um, no regard to real education or training they might have. A lot of the trade folks that I know, they've had more schooling than some PhDs that I know, you know, and, oh, and yes. I mean, good quality schooling of, of practical skills, you know, yes. so that that's, that's the big uh, differentiator there, I think, in a lot of cases. Oh, I agree. I mean, I mean, you nailed it, right? Like the practical learning that happens to to build the skill set, to earn a journeyman license, or to be effect, an effective trades or craft person, is exactly that. It's practical. Like we learn the idea, the concept, and then you got to do it. Where in a lot of cases, that's not the case. You spend an extended period of time learning concepts, and then you got to go do it. And so the the wisdom, if you will, or the knowledge doesn't really cement until you apply and figure out that it's not as easy as it was. It's not as easy to do it as it was to read it. <laughs> um, but here's here's one thing that I've been tinkering with because the I feel like one of the really important things that I learned as a craft person, as a plumber, apprentice, and so forth, that is 100% helping me in building figuring out how to build my business was back then I was given a pile of material, some information and some tools. And it was my job. I had to use my skills, my wherewithal to make that turn that actualize that into something. And that is a matter of iteration, right? I, sometimes I installed a whole mechanical room and I had 300 leaks. Sometimes I installed the whole mechanical room and I had one leak and I figured out how to do the thing over and over and over and got better through practice. And so like that little, that experience happened every single day. So the reps that I did craft workers get in terms of trial and error or success and failure are like a life experience that can translate into anything. I mean, I think a lot, a lot of the uh, 
my friends now, they're CEOs of their own big, I mean, multi-million dollar corporation, well, not corporations, businesses, trade businesses, and they don't have an MBA. <laughs> they develop the skill of how to try something out, figure it out, learn it and make it better. And that came from assembling, building and putting things together, which I don't know if that's necessarily apparent in every other um, career, but I know for sure in the trades, it was 100% what I was swimming in. I, I love that analogy. And, and I think that one has legs, Jesse, uh, that idea of uh, pile of materials, you said information, I translated that to blueprint, you got a, a design scheme that somebody yep. gave you, and then you got tools. And yep. And then you, you being the, the, the human hand and brain to, to pull all that together and create something, uh, that, that's an amazing analogy and, and a really powerful one to think about. And it is, uh, I think, a really important principle that really, regardless of what kind of business you might be running, that's it. And you know, even thinking about that pile of materials, time is in there as well. Time is one of those <laughs> yes. elements that's in that pile of materials you've got. Sure. You, you've only got so much time to get this thing done. So there's a deadline hanging out there somewhere that somebody is sensitive Always. to. Always. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I love that. You need to turn that into something, a program or a book or whatever. That's a, that's a great... Great story. Well, let's uh, let's talk about this idea you brought up and introduced me to the concept of culture of appreciation. Where where, where does that come from for you? Yeah, so I've I've been able to listen to several of your episodes and I'm totally on board with the idea of culture. And I imagine your listeners are jiving with it too. So I'm going to come back to that, but I want to first define appreciation. Because it often people think I mean pats on the back and hugs and very polite behavior. That is not what I mean by appreciation. And so when I think of, you know, there's been some, there's a handful of leaders that contributed in tremendous ways to my career path and my growth. And the way they demonstrated appreciation was they provided me with a challenge. Right. They appreciated my potential enough to challenge me to do more. And then they gave me the resources to meet the challenge. So they didn't just say, you know, go do better, go faster. They didn't just say that. They said, here's the target. Here are the things you need to get there and come back if you need more. That to me is a demonstration in appreciation. When I was struggling, they invested the time to hear me out. When I had a thought or an idea or a question, they allowed me or gave me the space to articulate those thoughts, questions, and ideas. And they didn't tell me what to do, which I hated. I, mean, I have one story. I remember we, were, we had a shutdown in the middle of San Antonio, downtown San Antonio on Houston Street, which is like a busy, busy street. We we're shutting down. We had cranes coming in. Um, we had police to like, go, go, like, it was a big deal, big, big investment. And then weather came in. <laughs> like there was there was a forecast of, of a thunderstorm to come. And if the thunderstorm came, we couldn't lift the crane and it was gonna be, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars like gone. And we had to do it again. And so I called my boss and I said, Hey, like <laughs> here's the deal, man. We got everything lined up. I got eight guys, we're gonna be working overnight, da 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 da. Okay. He said, What's the problem? I said, Well, the forecast is it's like sixty percent rain. He said, Okay. And I'm like, what do I do? <laughs> he says, well, you need to make a decision. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like, I know that. I want you to tell me what the right decision is. And he said, Jess, this is part of your job. You're going to make a decision. It might work out. It might not. And you're going to learn from it. So make a decision. And like, I was pissed. Like I was not happy about his <laughs> answer, right? Like not at all, but he demonstrated appreciation in my aptitude and ability to make a decision and learn from it. And so when I'm talking about appreciation, it's a bigger thing than saying thank you and, and giving somebody compliments. It's helping pull or draw or tap into the awesomeness that they have within them. And so 
How does that land with you? Is that too lovey-dovey, Mr. Doug? No, no, no. That, that's a great story. And give, give us a punchline. How did the decision work out? Oh, so oh, I love, yeah. So the, the storm blew over. We got a little bit like it missed downtown. We got a little bit of drizzle. We did the thing. Now, one lesson I did learn <laughs> um, is we were downtown, and I think it was like a Thursday or Friday night. And... Um, the club there's a there was a we were right off of the river walk here the san antonio river at hard rock cafe we we're right down the road from hard rock cafe and so when the bars closed at 2 a.m last call then we had this new problem because we were right next to a big old parking lot with all the party animals coming down the street and wanting to climb on the crane and whooping and hollering and i had no plan to deal with that so folks if you ever <laughs> Shut it down by the river walk. Make sure you have a plan to deal with, with, with the party <laughs> animals out there. <laughs> well, as you were describing that, I, I, I was doing some flashbacks in my own mind to my early career uh, as a young officer in the Army. And I always look back on that time and realize, you know, at 22, 23, 24 years of age, I was given huge choices and decisions to make. Uh, that affected so many things, you know, and ultimately, thankfully, and I call this thankful, I, I was never in combat. I never had to get deployed where actual live rounds were flying, but I had plenty of other choices and decisions to make that in, that affected the welfare of the troops I had under me and material and resources I had at my disposal. And I had some of those moments too, you know, as a young officer, I, I called the senior officer and said, sir, you know, I'm, I'm facing this bogey here, you know, and, uh, and here's what I'm thinking, you know, what should I do? And I, he didn't give me an answer either. You know, he said, he said, Thor, but your call, man, you, you know, you, and I had one colonel that actually said, yeah, this could probably make or break your career, but go ahead. What do you want to do? <laughs> Okay, no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> oh, beautiful. So, so you know, right, a lot of us are in those situations. Now, in terms of why I think it's, or I've decided that it's like ultra, ultra important, so much so that I believe it's the number one di differentiator in terms of like career success, business success, and quality of life. Not one of them, all three of them, is because the individuals that I, the leaders that I've seen, and like I said, all the time I had in the career uh, as a trade, on the trade side of the business, the time I worked for the general contractor and in the other job, I got exposed to hundreds of leaders in the construction space. From big, giant, massive data centers, all the way down to, you know, little bitty renovations. And I got to see, like there was a small percentage of, of those leaders of, of the business units or whatever that, the people around them were thriving and growing and promoting their business, like their, their financial performance was great. Their personal life was awesome. They were good people, uh, right? They were having an awesome experience in life. And what I could see was this thing that I refer to as demonstrating appreciation for people <laughs> because they didn't, by listening and asking questions and by not making the decision what happened to you and me, Doug, I think, is those leaders helped us connect with our agency. They helped us understand that we can make a decision, that we do have greater value than just coming to the boss to be told what to do. And when we have those that, that kind of repetition, our brain expands to really say, what else could I do? How else could I serve? What innovative, thoughtful idea do I have that can improve the experience for the people that I'm in charge of or that I'm responsible to? And then we start growing our awareness as individuals, which grows the, the performance of the business and so forth. And so I got to see them do that. They listened intently. They rarely gave direction unless you know people were in imminent danger or they were making a really bad decision. They typically said, what do you think? What do you consider? And then they found ways to advocate for those in their, their team members to get new opportunities and new experiences. And they, now on the same note, like if I wasn't performing or people on the job weren't meeting expectation, there was no him hawing around about it. Again, which I think is appreciation. 
if I got a booger on my face, I expect people to tell me I got a booger on my face. I, that is, you will appreciate me so much that you don't want me to go and embarrass myself in front of other people. Yes, it might be uncomfortable, but you're going to tell me the truth. If you don't tell me about it, I know what you're going to do. You're going to go tell everybody else about it. That is not <laughs> yeah. appreciation, right? Like that's just the way it works. And so I got to see that in, in like, I would say at its best. And I got to see like, oh, wow, that this is a great environment. These people get along. They're doing things. They're executing. They're delivering people, you know, all cascading all the way down to the installers in the field. Everybody's having a better experience. Then I go to another project and see, you know, the barking, yelling, threatening, screaming uh, uh, leader that knows everything and has all the answers. And it was miserable. <laughs> and, and I got to say this. The large majority of the projects that I've been on are the latter, right? Like the, that negative, um, just that less than awesome experience. And so that's when I said, ah, oh, okay, there's something there. I've been able to see it. I kind of see what happens because I was that type of leader early in my career. I, I, I didn't care about people. People were just a tool for me to meet my agenda. Um, and eventually, you know, I got slapped a bunch of times and got straight about really appreciating people and investing in them. And so I said, okay, if I've been in those shoes, I can help people make a transition out of those shoes. And for somebody that's that, like trying to figure out how to get uh, a better experience or have a better experience and provide a better experience, I know how to do that because I've been able to see it a bunch of times. Um, and so that's the thing now in terms of cult, it's a hundred percent associated with culture, right? Like the thought between building a culture and growing a culture. I appreciate both. My stance is this, you have a culture, whether you know it or not. <laughs> and if you're not being intentional about what that culture is, you got problems. Period. <laughs> yeah. I was talking to a client yesterday and we were talking about that. And I said, really this whole mystery about culture at a company boils down to one simple thing culture ends up driving how you do everything yes period and period. and and yeah. if if you're looking at your situation and say if you're the owner and saying to yourself i don't like what my team's doing we're missing the mark we're falling short we're making mistakes we're we got cost overruns on our projects yada 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 uh, chances are you got a really lousy culture because <laughs> you're not <laughs> the how you're doing your work is not creating good results. So it does start often with the whole idea of figuring out what you really want to have going on. And I, I frequently of late have been pointing to a general contractor I've met over in Florida. That, that's a privately held company, young man. It's a second generation deal. He, he bought it from his dad. But um, he grew it from like 10 million to 40 million in the time he's, he's run it. And I, I was talking to him, I said, so talk to me about your culture. What's your mission, vision, value statement? He says, it's all one thing. I said, what's that? He said, do the right thing. And I, I thought a minute, and at first I kind of barfed on it, and I said, yeah, oh, come on, man, that's cheesy, you know, that, that's <laughs> too easy. What does that really mean? How do you really do that? And he said, oh, no. He said, it, it, it. He said, you know, in construction, everybody knows this, whether you've run a construction company or contracted someone, you've got the concept that if there's a mistake in one part of the project and, and creates some extra cost to fix it, that cost gets plowed into another part of the project and, and updated on, in a change order so that the constructor is never short. You know, there, there's always this kind of thing. He said, I don't do that at my company. He said, if we screw it up, we're going to pay for it, period. Wow. He, said, he said, that's doing the right thing. And I said, wow, is, you know, is, is that expensive? And he said, well, it has been sometimes. He said, <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm not going to lie, you know, because it, 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 stuff does happen. He said, but here's the value. All of my customers know it. Yeah. And he said, that affords me the opportunity. I bid high. He said, I'm not the cheapest game in town. I don't, I don't cost cut my bids. 
he said, I, I do an honest bid, but that's the bid. And it, you're, it's never going to go up. It's never, you know, we're, we're not going to have that discussion on, on my projects. And he said, my customers know it. He said, I've had people that have worked with me now for years. And I've got a reputation in the business for being that kind of guy. And yeah. it pays off. He said, so... Have I suffered some losses on projects because of that? He said, none of my projects have ever lost money, none. And he said, you know, but, you know, have I had to come out of pocket and fix some things? Yeah, I, I, I do. I do. Yeah. He said, but my people know it and they make their own decisions out in the field about what is the next right thing to do. And, and that gets me back to my what I was getting to for an original point. When you define that culture, you know that's what you want. Guess what? You have to recruit and hire that behavior, that mindset. Yes. <clears throat> you can't hire the guy that just slap dashes and throws it out and hopes nobody notices. And then maybe it springs a leak, maybe it breaks, you know, and uh, you can't hire that guy to, to be on your team. You've got to hire somebody that has that same level of commitment and pride in their own work that they're going to do the right thing. Yeah, 100 percent. I think. Uh, like the example that you've given, if you have to show people, I think like I can't, I'm kind of with you. I'm like, well, that's kind of weak sauce, but you have to show people what that means, right? Like do the right thing is kind of a broad thing or maybe a relative thing. And he is the leader. If he says, look, man, we're not going to be passing the buck here. If we made the mistake, we're going to carry the cost. Of course, the rest of the people is like, oh, that's what doing the right thing looks like, right? So it's demonstrating as the leader, and it doesn't matter what level of the organization you're at. Like if you're, if I have one person, I'm a crew leader and I got two or three people on my team, or if it's just me and one person, a helper, I the behavior that I see from my helper is a mirror of what they're seeing from me. I have to demonstrate the behavior I want to see. And so in your this example, he says, do the right thing. And then he shows people what that looks like, precisely what that looks like so that they can mirror it. And again, I mean, I did this. This was when I had like my biggest breakthrough, I think. One of the biggest breakthroughs I've had in my career. I had a boss and we were having a discussion about the thing I was in charge of. Uh, and he was asking me, if I thought it would be how long it would take to like have a hundred percent adoption. <laughs> and I said, Oh, I don't know, five, 10 years. And he said, what the hell are you talking about? Like, I'm expecting 12 months. <laughs> I'm like, Oh, like we're way off track. And I knew at that point, like I was with the company for a year at this point. And like, I'm on, I'm on the chopping block right now. <laughs> I just put my head down on that block. And in, but I knew I was like, I think I know why he, why we're so far off. He thinks a year, I think five. And so I said, well, I'm on the block. I might as well say what, share my honest observation of the situation. And I said, hey, <laughs> I hear what you're saying. I said, but here's the thing. I'm assuming that you're making that assessment based on these reports and this structure of reporting and that he's like, yeah, like that's what all those stuff is. I was like, okay. And so, well, let me tell you the truth of what's happening on this project and this thing on this thing. And I did. And he's like, oh, I had no idea. I was like, I know. So because, and this is a natural or a true thing for every, I think every leader is there's layers of the organization that are polishing up stinky news so that they don't get yelled at by their boss. And then that boss polishes it up a little bit more before they take it to their boss. And so this person, my boss at the time, was like five or six levels removed. So by the time it got to him, it started off as a stinky turd. By the time it got to him, it was a polished, glowing bottle of potpourri, but it wasn't real. And so I took the opportunity to like, well, let me just tell you the stinky truth about it all. And <laughs> the best compliment I've ever received, he said, Jesse... Do you have a way of delivering very bad news in a digestible manner? And you do it with complete abandon for the career implications it might have. <laughs> and I'm like, did you just tell me that you would fire me? <laughs> um, but it, the reason I share that story is because 
there's every leader is kind of in that situation just because of the power dynamic right like you have authority i have authority over somebody they want my favor because they want security they want significance they want to grow so they don't want me to be pissed off at them so they're incentivized just by human nature to soften bad news and then if that continues to happen it gets overly soft now when i told him the difference i also took a step forward and said and here's what you're doing that contributes to that and at that point we're like boom we're like he said okay we need to meet more often i need more of this information because he was not aware of how his behaviors decisions and reactions were contributing to the culture that was not producing the outcome he was seeking whereas in the example you gave do the right thing this is what it looks like and then everybody understands oh that's the way it's supposed to be done so to your point people are going to be operating delivering and behaving in the way that they're getting signals from the leader in the way that the leader is signaling and so if me as a leader when i don't like that outcome i got to like suck it up and say okay maybe i've designed a system to produce the precise outcome that i don't like and if that's true that means i can tweak the system to produce the outcome that i want which i think is the culture thing yeah yeah i think the challenge and i love your statement there about the whole cascading up you know people think of you know what flows downhill but right, there right. is a reverse impact of that of information going up and protecting those above and you know sometimes it's a challenge i i tell a famous story now that and i've written about it and talked about it I once was doing some consulting work for an executive that was a living personification of the emperor has no clothes. Yes. <laughs> this person did not want to hear bad news. Ah. And I was a project lead of a giant project that was going on and I got called into, you know, what was going to be weekly status meetings, which is logical. It's, you know, it's what I expected. Of course, my MO was, well, here's the status of the project. Here's some problem things we've got going on, but here's my recommended solution. Do you agree? Can I get a green light to go do that? Cause you know, and I'll fix this problem. It, it's my responsibility. I got it, I'll fix it. And I started going down that MO and the first time I uttered the word problem or challenge, it was yeah. like, <clears throat> like a bomb went off in the room and all the air got sucked out of it. Yeah. And lieutenants that had had a tradition of working for this executive looked at me like I had just committed a cardinal sin, you know, and this executive just froze and went into this almost screaming fit about there are no problems on my project. Uh, yeah. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Then why are we having this meeting? You know, why? Right, what, what you, what, I'll send you a memo. You know, why are we having? Why are we wasting this time in this meeting anyway? Uh, I I suffered through that for literally years. It was a several year, multi year project we were doing, and um, it it was a roller coaster ride of epic proportions trying to get this leader to understand. Uh, and uh, and and I, I'm sad to say I I never got them over the goal line on how to comprehend what what that was about and that was just how they were wired and they were used to everybody sugarcoating it and uh -huh. spraying the potpourri on everything you know getting it up there so yeah well Doug I think back to the appreciation thing right one of the things that I've seen these leaders with the people centered focus that walk in appreciation is when they receive problems, they celebrated problems. Like, I, I think that, which I know takes enormous discipline, but I could bring a problem to the table without getting my head bit off. Guess what? If when I can do that, I'm not going to polish it anymore. Like, at, in my head, when I'm leading and my team is bringing me a problem, they're bringing it to me because I have greater influence, greater authority, and access to greater resources, and they need that. <laughs> so 
they bring me the problem. I say, thank you for bringing me that problem. What do you need from me so that you can go solve that bad boy? When Culture, right? Like when I celebrate problems, thank you for surfacing that. What do we need to fix it? That's a whole different experience. And guess what? Then they say, oh, that wasn't bad. Well, there's this other problem. Awesome. Because problems travel in herds. My my One of my coaches, David Verbal, said, Jesse, be careful when you get into problem solving because they travel in herds. There's never just one. <laughs> True. And so people start bringing us problems. We start supporting, equipping, arming our people with the resources and the agency to solve them. Guess what? operationally, we start performing better. We bite their heads off. Guess what? We get potpourri. Which one do you want? Right. Well, and underlying all that is another premise that I've experienced, and it's taken me decades to come to this conclusion because I used to be a very contrarian about what I'm getting ready to say. But like what that. my position is now, and as I coach leaders in all levels, I encourage them to think about the idea that if, and this is a big if, but if you have done a reasonably good job of hiring the right people for the jobs you've got, those people are going to want to show up and do good work, period. Yep. And the challenge as a leader is to what we talked about a minute ago, you got to show them what good is. Yes. You have to explain what a win looks like in this environment, what, whatever kind of work we're doing, whatever job we're on, whatever task we've got. The leader needs to model and explain and demonstrate what good is and or maybe even great. But let them know that. And if you can do that, they're going to do the right thing and they're going to move that forward and create the productivity. Now, the, the counter of that is, and I love it when a leader comes to me, a new client hires me and we start talking and he says something like, my team is just so bad. You know, they, 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 they don't do anything. They don't, you know, they, they can't seem to get anything done. They don't get it right. And I'm, I'm looking at them like, guess what? <laughs> Look in the flipping mirror, you know, it's all on you, dude, if that's a true statement. Because, and, and, and usually what, when we peel that onion, what we find out, it's not that they're doing bad work, they're just not doing good work. Mm -hmm. Or they're doing fundamentally nothing. And so my mantra is, guess what? If you haven't showed them what the right thing to do is, Remember, they want to do the right thing. If you haven't showed them that, they're going to do nothing because they don't want to do the wrong thing. Yes. Yes. Oh, so, oh, my goodness. And it's an interesting thing, right? Because I experienced it when I became a crew leader, when I became a foreman, superintendent, regional man, like same thing. You get promoted to this role, a role of leadership. I'm a human being, so I've got an ego. I've got insecurities. And for whatever reason, I believe that as the leader, I got to have all the answers. Which, okay, I got to have some competency, right? Um, but what happens, again, this is the appreciation. When somebody comes to me with a situation and I don't listen to them and all I do is give them the answer, do this. They go do it. They come back again. I don't let them finish their thing. Do this. What I'm doing is I'm conditioning them to be dependent on me. So now anytime there is a decision to be made or an abnormality that they're experiencing, they're going to come to me. I feel like I'm a leader because I'm telling everybody what to do, except that now everybody around me is coming to me for the answers. I'm happy to solutionize and tell them what to do. They don't have to bring or tap into their critical thinking. And I'm going, getting more and more irritated because nobody can make a decision. Nobody shows initiative. Everybody's so damn scared. They stand and wait for direction. And the truth is I created that situation. Yeah. Whereas if all I do, instead of giving answers, ask questions, let them maintain ownership of the problem, and help them see that I can give them, connect them to resources, but it's their bad boy to carry over the finish line. Then I, they're, then I'm tapped into their capacity, their agency, their their critical thinking skills, 
and they can go make things happen. And I'm not as distracted. So now I can go do my job and do like the forward thinking vision type stuff that I should be doing as the leader. Yeah, I love what you said there. And I, I talk a lot about that. Anybody that has been a client of mine, we've probably ended up visiting this subject uh, maybe multiple times. The idea is if you're the leader and you're just telling them that direction, giving them the answer and sending them away, you know, go away, leave me alone kind of thing. You're right. You're not developing them. You're not expanding their understanding. And the reality is your ability to give that answer is a process. You've learned it through experience. When, when the problem is presented, you've got a process. It may be nanosecond in your brain, but I promise you there's layers. You go, if then, then that, that then, this, that. And there's this waterfall of choices that you know from your experience. And you go, boom, here's the answer. Well, if you want to teach that to your people, I love what you said. And this is exactly what I tell clients. Ask them questions. Yes. Oh, okay. So you're telling me X that you think that's the problem. Interesting. Who else have you talked to? What else have you thought about? Where else did you go? What else do you know about this subject? You know, and, and you, you get them to start processing that critical thinking that yeah. you mentioned and, and you, you teach them, oh, that's the way you come to that conclusion. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that skill there is that I do, I was working with the team up in Dallas with the construction team and, and one of the, the team members, she was like, holy moly, Jesse, like, I'm just recognizing, I like to complain about my husband and the kids. And based on what we just went through, it's kind of my fault. <laughs> And the reason I share that is because it's not just a, like an experience in the workplace. It's a human experience. We do it at home. We do it with our kids. We do right. it with our family members. Like we create, I mean, this is my kind of anchor point that I go back to to like maintain um, or at least try to manage my ego is most of the problems I'm experiencing, rather all of the problems I'm experiencing, I'm contributing to them in some form or fashion. Yeah. Like, how, how about instead of blaming everybody, how about I figure out how, what my contribution is and minimize that? <laughs> so, <laughs> right. And it's, it's, it's a transcendent experience that, that we can fix, but it takes practice. It takes, um, I, I'm going to say, some courage in terms of being vulnerable, right? So to be in a leadership or authority role and not give the answer is scary because if I don't have the answer, am I really a leader, right? So there's some ego in that. You don't have to have the answer. You just got to be a little bit vulnerable and try and let people take, keep, maintain ownership of the thing and see what happens. Right. Right. It could right. go wrong. It could be bad, but it could also be awesome. There's the vulnerability right there. Give it a shot. Well, and I, it, it, it's not uncommon. I've had clients when they go exercise this idea of starting to ask those questions rather than just jump quick to the solution. They come back and say, my people actually know a little more about this and they've they've thought a little further and we've got a better answer than I've ever had before, you know, and it's like, well, back to your point, let's celebrate that. Let's let's express yes. appreciation for that. Let's move it forward. Well, look, Jesse, this has been great, man. We're about up on time. I, I got a feeling you and I could talk about this all day long and oh, yeah. uh, I think it'd be great. Um, tell the folks the best way to get a hold of you if they're interested in knowing more and maybe even working with you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. So two ways. If you're on LinkedIn, look, search Jesse Depth Builder. You'll find me there. Uh, and I'm like hyperactive on LinkedIn. I'm post probably daily, sometimes twice a day. Uh, the other place, if there's a bunch of things, I got my a lot of irons in the fire. Um, and so the other place to like access all the other stuff is on my website, which is depthbuilder.com depth as in deep trust deep vulnerability and deep appreciation great great well as always folks we're going to have that information in the show notes for you to hop down and click on and uh, one last time jesse thanks for sitting in really appreciate it 
My pleasure, sir. Thank you. Well, with that, folks, we're going to wrap up. I do want to remind you, we have a video version of this show over on YouTube, channel by the same name, Leadership Powered by Common Sense. If you've been uh, listening on your favorite streaming service, uh, don't be afraid to hop over to YouTube when you get a chance. Check out the video archives. Leave us a note. Leave us a comment. Always would love to hear from you. And if you've got a desire to be a guest or know someone who should, drop me a line. There's all kinds of information on my social media posts to put a uh, guest recommendation link in there. But with that, we're going to say goodbye, sign off, go out there, make it a great day. You've been listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense, hosted by Doug Thorpe. If you would like to know more about the coaching and advisory services he provides, visit DougThorpe.com.